Well, I'm speaking from words that Paul wrote to Timothy, and they have nothing to do with golf. But they have everything to do with being an awesome man of God, woman of God, being an awesome church. I direct your attention today, 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting verse 3. Now, these are awesome words. Join with me, Paul says to Timothy, in suffering. When the going gets tough, Timothy, you've got a life to build. You have a destiny to fulfill, and it's not going to be easy. At times, you're going to be grinding it out, and it's going to require a gritty Christianity. And so I ask you, Timothy, to be like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown, except by competing according to the rules. Third picture, verse 6, the hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. He says, Timothy, you've got to be like a soldier, not a civilian, like an athlete, not a spectator, like a farmer, not a consumer, and if you'll reflect on these, Timothy, the Lord will give you insight. You'll be who you're saved to be. You'll lead in an effective way. Timothy was going to pastor the church at Ephesus. Ephesus was an epicenter, a strategic. And what happened there would have an influence way beyond. You have an epicenter called your heart. What happens in your heart has far-reaching implications to the people around you, to the future that God is giving you. So let these words find you and challenge you and encourage you. Let these words bring us to a time of prayer and submission to God. And so let's just take these on. Here's verse 4. He says, be like the soldier, not the civilian. If you've ever spent time talking to a warrior, you know they've just accessed an entirely different vantage point on life. They have access to perspective and an awareness because they are coming from a wartime mentality. It's a whole different identity. So they perceive, they act and react out of that mentality. And so they are aware of an enemy. They are aware of threats. And Paul says, Timothy, lean into this. You can't build your future if you get caught up like the civilian in triviality. You got to know you have an enemy. There's a battle to fight. Ephesians 6 says that we are fighting not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces. Corinthians says we've been given weapons of warfare. They're not carnal. They're mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. Timothy, if you understand you are a soldier, you'll fight the right enemy. You'll be in the right battle. I don't know who said it, but it is so worth Repeating, And here's the quote, if we don't understand our enemy, we will chop at the fruit instead of chopping at the root. See, we're not focused. It's, it's, it's the wartime mentality that keeps us dialed to who our enemy is. Paul is saying, Timothy, you must keep in your biblical worldview that there is an enemy called Satan. But Jesus has come to destroy the works of the enemy. And you're fighting against that enemy. And you've not been given a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love, power, and a sound mind. Timothy, I see faith in you. It was first in your grandmother and in your mother. Now it's in you. Faith in God and you will overcome. You will press forward. But don't get entangled. The word entangled means to weave. To weave into the fabric of your character those things that just really don't matter. The movie Hurt Locker that came out many years ago, it's about these warriors who disarm bombs. And there's a, a unique scene where one of these warriors comes from deployment, and he's standing in the supermarket on the cereal aisle. And in the movie, it's called the cereal aisle scene. And the guy just acts with his face. He's standing in this aisle to get cereal, and there are all of these brands almost floor to ceiling, all of these options. And his face is saying, here I am with a wartime mentality standing in the cereal aisle 
with all of these options and it is screaming with this question. How do you integrate that wartime mentality with the civilian lifestyle? And I think that captures what Paul is saying to Timothy. As you just do life, it will be easy to allow triviality, the fear of man, cultural whatevers to just be woven into the fabric of who you are. But Timothy, you are not one with a civilian mindset, but with a warrior mentality. You are a soldier. And so you've been given weapons of warfare to fight. So you fight this good fight. And Timothy, you do it until it's like, it's the instinct of who you are. You don't have to be so intentional to keep the wartime mentality. It is your first response because you're living from that identity. Church, 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 hear me today. This is a word to us. We're in a battle. And we are equipped by God to push back the kingdom of darkness. We storm the gates of hell and they don't prevail. The gates are defensive measures. They're not moving. We are the church taking ground. We're on the move. And so we push back the darkness. We, we bring clarity in a context of so much confusion. We bring strength in a culture of so much weakness. While we watch this generation get marked in seasons and situations with names of depression and pandemics and political upheaval, rise up church and have that wartime mentality. We're not fighting flesh and blood. We're fighting spiritual forces. But with the weapons that are not carnal, we will pull them down because we're not striking at the fruit. We're putting the ax to the root of the tree. Come on, give God a great praise right there. And then he says in verse 5, be like the athlete, not the spectator. The athlete who receives the victor's crown because the athlete competes according to the rules. Timothy knew that Paul was referring to these athletes that would make extraordinary commitments to train. Paul said everybody runs, but only one receives the prize, and it's tied to the one who's most disciplined. Paul said, I discipline my body. I make it a slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. The intensity, the focus, the commitment. God is saying, I'll give you power, but I got to find some men and women that'll take on a mentality. You are not a civilian, you're a warrior, you're not a spectator, you are an athlete. You're taking on a mentality to train yourself for the purpose of godliness, for longevity, for living a life that represents who Christ is and what he's done. I love Dallas Willard's quote here. Let's just take it a sentence at a time. However, we may understand the details, meaning of Christianity, there can be no doubt on the biblical picture of human life that we were meant to be inhabited by God, I love that, and live by a power beyond ourselves. Human problems cannot be solved by human means. Human life can never flourish, and I like this, unless it pulses, quotes, with the exceeding greatness of his power toward us, who believe, end of quotes, like your life. See, when he says to be the athlete and to train, you're not to come up with all the power. You're to come up with the surrender. And then you get the power. I like this, a life that is flourishing because it is pulsing with the exceeding greatness of his power. It's toward us. Now watch this. Only constant students of Jesus, the devoted, the disciplined, will be given adequate power to fulfill their calling. And here we go. 
preach Dallas Willard to be God's person for their time and their place in their world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dallas Willard is no doubt so influenced by Paul's writings here in 2 Timothy. And he is saying, hey, Timothy, Paul is saying, Timothy, I see, I see faith in you. I see the gifting. I see the gift of leadership. You, you are a difference maker. But if you'll have the mentality and, and the discipline of an athlete, then your great gifting and charisma won't take you where your character can't keep you. You can bear the weight of the influence of God. You can be useful as a vessel of God because you have given yourself in such a way to being so devoted to God that you've disciplined yourself. Meaning, watch this, the athlete, Timothy gets this. He knows that Paul's referring to an athlete that's done so much preparation in private because that's the way it is. Everybody attends the game, but the game comes and it goes. We're talking months, even years of private devotion that showed up in that public influence. Timothy, put your name there, put our church there. The way you conduct yourself in private, the way you give yourself to the spiritual disciplines in private will mean everything to your public, profound influence. The name of Jesus will bear power through your life. There will be a sustained witness coming from your life if you are guarding your heart when no one is looking. Because who we are when no one is looking is who we really are. And see, Timothy is getting this. Man, this is a strong word from Paul to Timothy and to us. Saying, we, Timothy, you cannot build your future being a spectator. The opposite of the athlete is the spectator. You're not gifted, blessed, saved, graced by God just to watch life happen. Just to watch days come and go. There is no such thing as an ordinary day. We're living ordained days. We're in this place. We're in this time. We're here. We're now. You have your influence. It's very, very sovereign. It's intentional. It was ordained. Now honor the significance of this moment and take this challenge that Paul gave to Timothy and say, don't just watch it happen. Don't be lukewarm. Don't go with the flow. Come on, get out on the playing field. I will watch Ricky Fowler today. I will watch ORU tonight. Hey, hey, hey. Can you imagine being in the game? Can you imagine standing over a putt that could be a $3.6 million putt? You know, if you're, if you're a, a sports fan, you will feel that. I guarantee you, Pastor Zach will not sit down during the entire OR. He'll be... Because he is, he's all in. But that's him on the field as well. I am, I, I want us to see this. I love being able to watch, but I'd much rather play. I would much rather be on the field. I'd much rather be on the course. I would, I would, if I keep talking about golf, I want to go golf right now on Sunday. Like, I got the cart right here. Baldy's cart is right here, ready for me to, to go. Watch this. You know, you know how it is in life. Let me just use the church as an example. We have all this stuff that happens, but only 20% to 40% are involved. We have extraordinary 
blessings when it comes to neighbors and nations and all the stuff we do. But it's still less than half that everybody else is just watching. Can I preach? Everybody else is just, just spectating. And Paul here is giving Timothy a challenge about the way he lives his life. But he's also saying, Timothy, if you're going to build a church that's going to impact the epicenter of Ephesus with all of the godlessness that's around you, then you must raise up people that have a wartime mentality and an athletic mentality, not civilian or spectator mentality. And I bring a high calling to a church that has never wanted to be mediocre. Let's live up to the high call of God and let's win the victor's crown. Speaking of that crown, there's the crown of righteousness that will be awarded when we stand before Jesus. There's the crown of unfading glory that we will receive. There is the crown of life. And you have to believe that heaven thinks of a crown way differently than we do. Because heaven is just next, 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 next level. I mean, if the asphalt is gold and the iron is pearl and the water is crystal, then what is a crown defined by heaven? Because the king's defining the crown. On a Palmer, he had given a sultan king golf lessons. And the king wanted to return a gift for his time. And Arnold says, well, I collect golf clubs. A few weeks later, Arnold's back in the States at his home, and he gets a FedEx package. He opens it, and it's a deed to a 300-acre golf club, complete with restaurant, swimming pool. And Arnold stepped back. He said, what in the world? And it dawned on him. He says, when I say golf club, I'm thinking putter. But when you say golf club to a king, he thinks 300 acres. The king inspired Paul to say, tell the church that if you'll discipline yourselves for godliness, you'll receive a crown. I know what a crown means to me. But when a king says, you're going to get a crown, I have a thought that is beyond words. It's beyond imagination. Anybody in the house want to run this race and win so that we receive the crown? And then we get to take that crown and place it at the feet of Jesus. Wow. Timothy watched these athletes that actually competed in the games, and he watched them get their crown look more like a wreath, and they would place it at the feet of their Roman idol. And he knew that the picture Paul was giving him was that faithfulness, discipline would have a payoff eternally and he would get to place before Jesus that crown. Whew. Let's never stop living for that day. Let's never lose that perspective. Here's number three. Be like the hardworking farmer. How many of you like to go to a farmer's market? Let me see your hand. You like that? There's a lot of farm to table talk, a lot of shows now farm to table, and you can watch a show, and in 30 minutes, you can go from farm to table. Like everything that happened in the field ends up on the table, but what we know is that there was a lot of process and time to go from farm to table. We go to the farmer's market, there was a lot of process and time for all of that produce to now be available. Hey, Timothy. You cannot be like the consumer who wants everything easy and convenient and immediate. Timothy, the man of God, you are and are becoming is a result of time and process. Timothy, there will be times that growth is barely perceptible. Timothy, there will be times that growth is slower than you ever thought it would be. You keep tilling the soil of your heart and you keep planting the seed of the word and you keep weeding those things that don't belong and you keep watering it with the word and with worship and with prayer 
and in due season, Timothy, you're going to reap a harvest. You're going to reap a harvest of godliness, a harvest of spiritual maturity. You're going to reap a harvest. I've read of farmers who plant incredible crops, and when people eat from their harvest, they're responding to perhaps how sweet it is or just the uniqueness of what they're tasting. But when the farmer who planted it eats it, I've read these farmers say, what I'm tasting is faithfulness, hard work, day in and day out, believing in the possibility of a seed, fending off all of those threats to what had been planted and what was, what was expected. When the farmer who plants it gets that first part, gets to partake, they are tasting the process. The time. Oh, do you hear the Holy Spirit saying, it's not all grind. There are those moments where you will taste the spiritual progress. You'll go, I have gone next level. I'm not who I was. I'm beyond where I used to be. God is working. God is working. Hear the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. To the assembly, to every man, every woman here, stand firm. That's a wartime mentality. Let nothing move you. Stay disciplined. That's the athlete. Give yourselves fully to the work. That's the farmer. And you know, soldier, athlete, and farmer, your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Come on, praise God that there's a payoff. There is a payoff for serving Jesus. As the worship team comes, the payoff is this. Beyond warfare is victory. Beyond the athlete's effort is the prize. And beyond the agricultural labor of the farmer is the harvest. Can you say amen? Don't drift. Don't back up, don't back off, don't back away. Don't ease up. Be more intentional. Be, get on your game face like it's game time. Be all in. Keeping your eyes on Jesus, who was like for sure the ultimate soldier because he fought sin, Satan, death, and hell on our behalf. Like the ultimate athlete, Jesus competed for the prize, the joy that was set before him. That joy was you and me. That we would find that place of calling and crying out to him. And we would experience the redemptive power because he endured the cross. Having been tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin, he died, he rose again, passed through the heavenlies, and he's seated at the right hand of the Father because he he won. Finally, he's the ultimate farmer. He sowed the truth of the gospel into the world. He called disciples and he helped them to mature. He walked with them patiently in the process. And from that small group that he invested in, the gospel continued to spread until there is a global impact of Christianity. Because Jesus, like that farmer, planted the seed, watered that seed, fended off the enemies that would threaten that seed, and now there's harvest. There's a call in this passage to consecration, to holiness and influence. There's a call in this to consecration that allow us to have the character where we actually can bear the influence of God. No coasting, spectating, or consuming. It's too major of a moment for us to think like that and to live that way. If you have secret sin, repent. If you have secret shame, offer yourself to God and let him help you. If you become entangled in things that really don't matter, 
submit in a fresh way to God. Remember Jesus, remember the cross, remember the opportunity that you and us as a church family have been a set apart for these great days. God is releasing a vision today. He's painted a picture and anytime vision happens, there's a picture painted and you start to see yourself in the picture. And you start saying, hey, I'm gonna be like that soldier, like that athlete, like that farmer. Think about the first time you ever used binoculars. You look through and things are not real clear, but you learn to use the dial and you bring it into focus and it's vivid with your eyes closed. And you see the vivid inspiration of scripture in your vision today. Do you, do you hear the call from that word? Holy Spirit, I just pray for every man, every woman in this room to have a heart receptive to what you have said to us today. Every one of us sense a conviction around each one of these metaphors. We see opportunity and responsibility around each one of these. We hear you and we sense your conviction in our hearts. And we will not just hear this, we will put it into practice. Put it in practice. God speaking to a Timothy today. can build the future that God has ordained because you're going to refuse to just consume. You're going to refuse to be a spectator. You're going to refuse to just be a civilian. You sense it, don't you? He's weaving into the fabric of your mind a wartime mentality. He's stirring you to be disciplined, to open your Bible even when you don't feel like it and when nobody's looking, to worship because you have learned to honor an audience of one. Give yourself to the seasons, seasons where there's more planting than harvesting, seasons where there's hard, hard work, but you stay with it because you know, you know there's a payoff. Yeah. If you say, I, I, I wanna embrace this word today, I want to live this word. Would you just stand with me? And I would pray it be all of us. I'm standing with you. I'm, I'm answering this. I'm standing up going, God, I want this. I want this. I want this. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. The Holy Spirit is building a mentality. He's building a picture within you. He's building a motivation, a passion. Let it happen right now. Let it happen. Repent of sin. Repent of sin. Confess. Come clean. Come on, don't waste another day on the wrong path with the wrong target. Come on, come in to alignment. Come into alignment with God. Come into submission to God. Surrender. Be the best decision you've ever made. In the name of Jesus, I pray that your heart would be overwhelmed with the opportunity that he's placed before you. Stir our hearts, God, that we might be stirred. Turn us that we might be turned. Lord, renew your works in our day. Lord, do things like we could never imagine. 
not out of, of people that are consumers, but people that are walking it out. People that are given in commitment to you, knowing, knowing that if we don't become weary, we will reap. Somebody here, you're weary. Don't quit. Don't quit. Hear that. Don't quit. You're weary, but don't quit. Your time is coming. In due season, in due time, you're going to see the harvest. Come on, you believe in the power of the seed like the farmer. Now don't quit. Don't give up. Stay in the process. Stay in the process.